Hello. Welcome to the girls varsity basketball game, the Coeur d'Alene Vikings against the Lewiston Bengals. And we are close to tip off. Coeur d'Alene Vikings are coming into this game 14 and five. Their most recent game was against Post Falls where they won 59 to 46. And for the Lewiston Bengals, kind of struggling this season. They're at seven and 13. Their most recent loss was Golden Throne a couple days ago and they lost to Clarkson again. Uh, and it was 37 to 66. So losing big there, looking for a bounce back their home game. And we have the national anthem coming up and we will be right back after that. And an excellent job, as always, is that Lewiston band. And we are going to announce our starters for the Lewiston, excuse me, the Clarkston Vikings. Our first starter is number two, Madison Mitchell, a five foot eight inches senior. And then number 11, Brooks Lee Colvin, a five nine freshman. Now, number 21. Taya Lopez, a 5'8 junior, and number 23, Kendrell, Kendall Holkeck, a 5'7 senior. And last but not least, number 54, Kelsey Carroll, a 5'9 junior. Now we're going to move it over to Lewiston starting lineup. We have number three, Brianna Albright, a junior. Now, Junior number five, Sky Van Trees. Junior number 12, Addison McCarcher. Freshman number 14, Avery Lathan. And junior number 21, Reese DeGroote. So a couple young lineups there. I know Coeur d'Alene has a freshman starting and so do we, the Lewis and Bengals. So two very young teams as I, we mentioned before the loose and Bengals not having one uh, excuse me one senior and so both two very young teams we'll see how they battle together so their last game they met on the 16th and Coeur d'Alene won big 58 35 but I believe that was at Coeur d'Alene so this could be a different story here in Lewiston we will see we have Lewiston's McCarcher and Coeur d'Alene's Colvin for the tip off. I'm excited to see what underdog energy Lewiston brings to this game. Well, especially with McCarcher and DeGroot, you really are not out of any game when you have those two. And Carroll already with two on the board for Coeur d'Alene. Albright now at the ball. 
She picks up her dribble, sees DeGroote back to Albright on the right to Van Trees in the corner. Van Trees with the three, just misses. Lathan goes to the rebound, but it's tipped off of Colvin's hands of Coeur d'Alene. Lathan now inbounding. Sees McCarcher under the basket. And Colvin now with the ball. Looks ahead to Mitchell. Now Colvin up top. Colvin drives to the right side. Sees Holakek. And Holakek with the three points from Coeur d'Alene. Great start from Coeur d'Alene here. Yeah, I don't know if the Bengals haven't woken up on defense yet or if there's just a miscommunication on defense, but they're leaving the Coeur d'Alene Vikings wide open. McCarcher now inside, sees Lathan. Lathan throws two up and draws the foul. She's going to have two at the line. Yeah, it was a beautiful play by the Bengals. Good cut by Lathan and a good pass by the group, making that good connection up for two, and she's going to be fouled. And the foul was on 21, Lopez of Coeur d'Alene. Lathan's first one is up, and it's good. Second one's up, and good. Yeah, Latham's such a big aspect for this Bengal team. She's a freshman, but she's one of the most fiery people on this Bengal team. Lopez now with the ball. Looks up top to Holakek. Holakek with another three. It's no good. Albright with the rebound. Quick drive down the court. Sees DeGroote. And DeGroote is going to travel with it. Yeah, she kind of got caught up in her feet right there. Kind of a pass dribble, kind of an in-between, and she traveled with that. So far, Coeur d'Alene has definitely brought the energy to this game, and I don't think Lewiston has kept up with it so far. Well, it's such a different game compared to Golden Throne, where it's just a super loud and super fast-paced environment. This is the complete opposite, pretty quiet in this facility, and it's just a very slow-paced game. DeGroote now with the rebound. And it's almost picked off by Carroll, but Van Trees gets a hold of it. Van Trees sees Lathan inside. Lathan back to Albright. Albright loses it, falls over in the process, and Colvin gets it. Now Carroll under the basket, and her shot's no good, and Lathan gets the rebound. That was a full court heave by the Vikings there, able to deliver that pass on target. Van Trees now in the corner. Looks inside to Albright. Albright to McCarcher. And I think it bounces off of McCarcher's knees and there's a fight for the ball. It's gonna be a jump ball. And the Vikings did a great job of smothering McCarcher inside. She was pretty much triple teamed in the paint and that's what you need to do to, to stop McCarcher in the group. That's what we're seeing a lot more now, especially with these teams playing Lewiston for the second time in the season. They realize how dangerous McCarcher is down at that post, and so they have multiple girls on her whenever she gets the ball. And that's definitely been effective there. And the, when the opponents double their star players, as DeGroote has doubled right there, they are not very successful. It's great interior defense by the Vikings. DeGroote cannot keep a hold of it. It's going to be the Vikings' ball. Mitchell inbounding. Now, yeah, big, big shout out to Allie here, keeping these stats. I'm The stats that I'm reading it came from Allie, so I'm not taking credit <laughs> for this. But Reese Groot was the P1FCU Prep Athlete of the Week heading into Golden Throne. She had an interview with KLEW and definitely the leader of this Bengal team, no doubt about it. Yeah, it's definitely exciting when you get Prep Athlete of the Week, when you're recognized by a great community like Lewison's. And we did win the throne. So that was a game on Friday. Lewiston versus Clarkson. The girls lost and the boys won. And we won our spirit. And so the throne is back in Lewiston. Hole kick now to Colvin. Inside to Carroll. Carroll with another two. All right now with the ball. Looks so far ahead of McCarcher. And a great block from Colvin. Wow, I mean, that was just electric there. Oh my goodness. Looked like she could snatch that out of the air. That was a great recovery from Colvin Tupia. She was all the way down at the other post just making those two points. Yeah, turning great offense into great defense. It's normally the other way around, but with Colvin there, she turned that momentum into defense. 
And that reflects on her stats too. She is the top scorer um, of Coeur d'Alene with I think 108 points for the entire season. Delic now with the ball of Lewiston. Keeping her dribble alive. Looks up top, it's tipped off by Colvin. And Colvin is no good. That was a good hard foul by Albright there. She knew she was gonna get beat and so she made sure that that uh, Coeur d'Alene player, I can't see her number. Anyways, that Coeur d'Alene player who drove in would not score and she's gonna have to earn her points. Colvin's throws short. It's gonna be some quick subs. Yeah, Albright with two first per two personal fouls here in this early first quarter. Her second one's up, and it's good. Through inbounding, sees Delic. And Holman gets a hold of it after bouncing off a court of lane player. Lathan now. And a bad pass leads to the ball going out. And I think that's part of Coeur d'Alene's fiery perimeter defense, not allowing the Bengals to move the ball outside. And the same with inside, too. Just great all-around defense by Coeur d'Alene. DeGroote now inbounding, sees Delic up top. An attempt at a screen, but Delic ignores it, sees Lathan now to DeGroote. And it's taken by Colvin. Looks like we have some siblings on Coeur d'Alene's team. Number one, Tegan Colvin, and number 11, Brooksley Colvin. Lathan now with the ball, picks up her drivel behind the timeline. DeGroote now with it. DeGroote to Delic. And that's a pretty obvious foul from Delic right there. Or not foul, travel. Yeah, a couple costly turnovers for the Bengals. That's just something you can control and it's pretty demoralizing when that happens as a team because that's the one part of the game that you 100% can't control is how you uh, handle the ball on offense. Coeur d'Alene also has pretty much all the momentum right now considering Lewiston's two only points have come from Lathan's two free throws. And Carroll with another two points. Yeah, most of their points from the Bengals come from DeGroote there. She's averaging almost 13 points a game, and they definitely need to get her included if they want to get back into this game. So that's a full timeout. We're going to go ahead and take it with them. Quarter lane 12, Lewis in two. And so coming out of that timeout, both teams regrouping. And it's going to start with the Groot getting the ball out of bounds, probably to Latham. We now see Emery McCarcher down on the court for Lewiston. Looks like she may have subbed out uh, Avery Latham or Bay Delic. So Coeur d'Alene has siblings, and so do the Bengals on the court right now, Avery and Addie McCarcher. Colvin now with the ball. Up top to Colvin, her sister, and then to the right to Mitchell. Colvin now hands it off to Colvin. <laughs> Back to Colvin. Inside to Colvin. <laughs> and now Carroll up top. And a good crisp pass to Colvin. Back to Carroll. And Carroll with the layup. Colvin gets the rebound. And Colvin up top, a really long three. And it's no good. Yeah, Lewiston definitely needs to do a better job of boxing out and getting that defensive board. They really struggled with that when they played Clarkson on Friday. Clarkson got a ton of offensive boards. 
Especially when you see Lewiston uh, have a couple of inches for their advantage on height-wise. We see Reese group be a little taller than the Coeur d'Alene girls and Addison and Karcher. It's going to be Mitchell inbounding. And with this explosive offense of Coeur d'Alene, you can't allow them to have those second chance opportunities. Only allow them one shot per possession. Colvin now with the three, and it's good. Colvin with a nice looking three, kind of deep there. And she's definitely a player to look out for for this Coeur d'Alene Viking team. The Karcher now to Lathan. Some good ball handling from Lathan, a quick behind the back, but she's gonna travel while driving to the basket. Yeah, she took two steps out of that paint, and that's gonna be a travel. The third costly turnover, I mean four if you count that out of bounds pass, but yeah, definitely three where you can 100% control. Really just the unforced errors that allow Coeur d'Alene to just keep their momentum in this game. Yeah, like you said, it's just a demoralizing aspect of the game is those personal uh, travels. Especially because 90% of the time the girl knows that she just traveled and they just sort of stop and their energy's gone for a little bit. And now Wallace up top with the three and it's no good. Coeur d'Alene almost gets an offensive rebound, but it goes out of bounds. But looking at the bright side, this is going to be the same exact team next year, so they're only going to get better as the years go on. And this year maybe be a rebuilding year, kind of a year to get those, that chemistry together, and they can really turn it up next year. Lathan now with the ball, and she loses it, but McCarter picks it up. Now to Lathan. Lathan looks inside into group. And again, as soon as that ball goes inside towards that post player, they're swarmed by two or three quarter lane players and they really can't get through them. Yeah, I really think that's what caused that travel by DeGroote is that swarming defense just kind of knocked her off balance and that caused her to travel. Colvin now with the ball, sees Bridge. And it looks like Lathan's gonna knock it out. It's gonna stay quarter lane's ball. Bridge inbounding, sees Colvin. And Colvin looks inside, but looks like she was going for Lopez, but Lopez looks like the ball went right under her hand. It's yeah, gonna be a, out of bounds. That was a good idea by Colvin, unable to connect that pass, really not unable to get a hand on it. Caused that turnover, but definitely a good look. The Karcher now looks inside to her sister. No good, it's tipped off by a Coeur d'Alene player. Yeah, that's another thing the Bengals struggle with is forcing those passes, whether it's inside the paint or it's outside at the perimeter. They just kind of force those passes. Maybe that's the design play, but you need to look at your second, third, and even fourth option. DeGruy with the three! <laughs> Lewiston now at five. Yeah, that's such a great aspect of the Bengals is DeGruy's ability to make plays, and she just kind of controls the momentum shifts of this Bengal team. She is an extremely versatile player, able to make some easy two points down at the post and then still sink some threes. But then another part, she I don't know if she almost did too much there, but she could have definitely slowed the ball down and maybe not take control in her own hands there. Maybe slow down that offense, get a couple passes before you get a shot up. McCarcher now at the ball, sees DeGroote in the right inside of McCarcher. A perfect offensive play there, but just unlucky with the shot. Wallace now with the ball. Sees Lopez, Lopez with the three, and it's no good. Colvin gets the ball. Another offensive rebound for Coeur d'Alene there. Yeah, and that also resets that shot clock, and there is no shot clock. They can get the last chance opportunity. And Bridge gets the three for Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, I was just a nice controlled shot. You could, I knew that was going in right when she shot that. That just looked very good. And the Coeur d'Alene Vikings find themselves up 13. And Lewis is going to try to come up with a scheme to try and stop this explosive Coeur d'Alene team. 18 to 5 is your score. And we will see you at the start of the second quarter.
And we are back to start the second quarter. 18 to five, the advantage going to Coeur d'Alene. And it looks like the Bang, or excuse me, the Vikings are gonna start with the ball. Mitchell inbounding it. And Mitchell now with the ball after being fast too from Colvin. Now Colvin inside to Carroll. Carroll and the two points for Larson. That was a great bounce pass from Carroll on the inside there. Delic now with the ball from Lewiston. Sees Kessinger, DeGroote. And DeGroote sort of forces that shot. There's a hard foul there by number 11, Colvin. And, and that's gonna send DeGroote to the line. She might have just been trying to draw that foul. Maybe that's why she shot that, but a great, great awareness by DeGroote to attract that foul there. DeGroote's first one's up, and it's no good, a little long. And her second one's up, and it's good. It's been a pretty good defensive game for both sides. I know Coeur d'Alene has 20, but that's not too much in the first quarter, and especially that Coeur d'Alene defense only holding the Bengals to five in the first quarter. And three of those points were from a three-pointer, and the other two were from a free throw. And Holakek travels for Coeur d'Alene. DeGroote now with the ball inbounding, sees Delic. Delic up top. And panicking a little, sees Lathan. Lathan keeps it in, but hands it off right to Carroll of Coeur d'Alene. Carroll with the quick drive down the court, hands it off to Larson. And Larson's gonna be at the line for two after getting fouled by Delic. Yeah, both offenses really haven't found their groove yet. I know with Lewis, and it kind of takes a while. They're kind of known for coming out of the game kind of sluggish and then really picking it up in the second and fourth quarter. And as for Coeur d'Alene, they've been kind of pretty good on both sides, but that offense definitely lacking a little bit. Larson goes two for two at the line. Delic now with the ball for Lewiston. And she hands it off to DeGroote. DeGroote goes right with it, drives inside, sees McCarcher. And great defense by Carroll of Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, that was a great pass by DeGroote. She was just kind of found herself in midair and she kind of looked for someone. She was able to find McCarcher in the paint. Pretty good pass. Lathan with the lob pass to McCarcher and McCarcher, his shot is no good. And Cole, Colvin, Gets the rebound and gets fouled. Colvin inbounding it to Mitchell. Back to Colvin. Now Mitchell on the left, inside to Carroll, and Carroll with another easy two. Lathan now at the ball, sees DeGroote. The group picks up her dribble and loses it. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna say this again, Coeur d'Alene just with stellar perimeter defense, not allowing the point guards of Lucent to do anything. You do see some questioning uh, plays from Lewiston though. We saw Kessinger set up a screen for DeGroote and DeGroote decided not to use it instead of cross back over. However, her defender was right there and it caused her to pick up her dribble and lose it. Yeah, definitely panicking a little bit on offense. When they lose their dribble, they're just kind of looking for help right away. But they just need to be able to stay poised and be patient and wait for their teammates to come and help them. Communication is also a big thing on that. And as the team sort of uh, grows chemistry together, the longer they play together, uh, that communication will improve. We have Carroll at the line for Coeur d'Alene. And our first one's up. It's no good. And her second one's now up. And also no good. DeGroote with a nice rebound. 
sees Albright. Albright to Lathan, and another misinterpreted pass. Yeah, I think what, like you said, communication just really not there yet for this Bengal team. But I mean, we'll say it again, they will have the same team next year and they're gonna only become a better and stronger team as the years go on. And Carroll with another two. Coeur d'Alene, however, will not be losing one of their top scores, especially in this game, uh, Carroll, since she is only a junior, so they have that look to look forward to next year. And a travel. Yeah, just kind of another four shot by the Bengals there. Uh, the ball is very still on offense, not a lot of movement, and they're just kind of forcing the first shot they can get. Lathan inbounding under the basket. And Albright is able to keep it alive. Back to Lathan on the left side. Lathan drives in and two. That was a beautiful drive from Lathan there. Yeah, Lathan's just an explosive player. I said that before. But yeah, she's just able to be any defender she wants and just drive to that basket. She may not be the biggest on the court, but she's definitely very useful. Where she may lack in size, she definitely has athleticism to make up for it. Great stamina as a player. And again, goes for Lathan on the inside, but it's no good. Colvin picks it up, sees Polakek. Now Carroll, and her shot's no good. Carroll with the offensive rebound. Then to Mitchell. Now Colvin in the corner. It's just long. And another offensive rebound from Carroll. Now Colvin, and two from Colvin. Yeah, the Bengals just kind of look lost on defense, whether it's uh, them giving up offensive rebounds on Coeur d'Alene or just not getting and filling that paint to guard in the, in the paint, just kind of lacking everywhere. Lathan now with the ball. Sees Albright. Albright with the three, and it's good. Yeah, it was a great shot by Albright. That ball movement looked very good on that possession, and she was able to splash that three. So that's a 30-second timeout. We're going to go ahead and take it with them. And we are back after that Coeur d'Alene timeout. Coeur d'Alene is up 17, four minutes and two seconds left in this first half. It's gonna start with Coeur d'Alene. Colvin with the ball, taking it down the court. Sees Mitchell. Now up top to Wallace, then to Lopez. Lopez drives inside, goes to the two, and it's no good. Kessinger with the rebound, sees Albright. Yeah, Kessinger, another player we don't really give credit to, but she's got size of her own and she's able to dominate that paint as well. Coeur Lane now inbounding after an inaccurate pass from Kessinger. We have Colvin with the ball. Another thing to say, you can see our cheerleaders up by the student section there. It is their senior night tonight, exciting for them. Yeah, no girls to celebrate the senior night with. There are no seniors on this Bengal team. Lathan now with the ball. And she throws it up and it's good for two points. Albright steals it. And goes for the two, goes for her own rebound. And she passes it right to Colvin. I mean, give credit to Lathan and Albright just sticking with it and not giving up on the ball. They were able to score two there and Albright almost scored two of herself. Delg now with the ball. And 
Delg throws it up, it's no good. Balls with the rebound, looks ahead to Colvin. And Colvin with the two. That was a great pass from Wallace there. Couldn't have been any more perfect. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene has a great transition offense. And that team, they're just able to outrun the Bengals and get easy buckets. Lathan now with the ball. And again, some good ball handling from her. Sees Kessinger. Kessinger with the three, and it's no good. And some fight for the ball. Wallace gets a hold of it. Looks ahead to Colvin. Now to Mitchell. Then to Lopez, and Lopez's shot is no good. Lathan gets a hold of it. And Mitchell passed that ball in midair. She was jumping. She got the ball. And before she landed, she was able to dish it out to someone else. Kessinger keeps the ball alive for Lewis and sees Delic on the left side. Then all the way across, but she's going to be fouled. Fouls on five of Coeur d'Alene Bridge. We have Albright under the basket inbounding, and we have some subs from Lewiston. Lathan and Delic are going to take a seat, and Holman and DeGroote are back out on the court. Albright under the basket, sees DeGroote, then to Albright. Up top to Holman. Holman drives inside and gets fouled. It's going to be Albright inbounding under the basket again. Now DeGroote, Kessinger. Albright inside, Albright goes to the two. Misses everything and Colvin gets the rebound. Looks ahead to Wallace. And McCarcher picks it up from Lewiston. Good defense from her, Kessinger, now Holman. So both defenses kind of locked in into this game, really settling down and both sides are starting to get stops. Albright now with the ball, looks inside McCarcher. And again, great defense from Coeur d'Alene. Wallace with the ball, looks ahead to Mitchell. And Mitchell swings it now up top to Colvin. Colvin with the three, and it's no good. Holman now with the ball. Yeah, Bengals did a great job on that defense, defensive possession of guarding in the paint as Lewison's kind of having some struggles breaking that Coeur d'Alene press. Colvin as... with the steal. And the three. Wow, Colvin doing it all, getting that stop on defense, turning it into offense, a pull-up jumper there. Nice Albright. play by Mitchell. Albright now with the ball. And she... Little ankle breaker there. Yeah. I don't know if she... I don't know if it was ankle breaking We're gonna or call it an Mitchell ankle breaker. just falling over, but Mitchell tries to respond with the three, but it's no good. That would have been some good redemption for the fall there, but... It's kind all of good. expecting a reaction from the crowd there, but kind of quiet. Yeah. Wallace now with the ball. And it bounces off of uh, Lopez's shins, it almost looks like, and goes out of bounds. Well, not Lopez, since it's going to be Coeur d'Alene's ball. I think it went off to Groot's knee. That's, I think that's what I saw. I'm okay. not really sure. I trust you a little more. So, And Colvin with the long three, and it's no good. Good effort for a last second shot though. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene really pulling away on this game, have a 20 point lead heading into halftime. But the Bengals have, are known for their third quarter play. Julie Fisher doing it, always does a great job of those halftime speeches it seems like. Getting that momentum to change and we'll see if that's the case here in this third quarter. We will see you in around 10 minutes for some third quarter action.
and hello, welcome. My name is Brian Chanel. I'm bringing you this little halftime. I do know there are some cheer family members out there that are here just to watch this. Uh, we had, um, oh, now my brain is going to break. We had Cora go through already, and Scout and Avery, uh, Alfred. And right now we have uh, boys senior um, Ryan Carper going up with his family. Also, Ryan Carver's birthday today, so lucky him. And our next two, another set of twins, Lindsay and Olivia Bren. Um, luckily, they're with their brother, Christian Bren, walking them out, and they're both their parents. Lindsay's plan on going to U of I. Uh, well, her favorite thing, uh, Bengal memory, was helping choreograph LHS, and she would like to thank her coaches and her family. She's planning on going to LCSE as a labor, labor, uh, labor and delivery nurse. She also wants to thank Coach Heidi and Coach Josh. And that is the Bren Twins. And that was our half of the LHS Seniors Senior Night. Uh, stay tuned. The other half will be at the boys' basketball game. Um, and again, that was the Alfred Twins. So Scout and Avery, Cora, Bella, Ryan Carper, and the Bren Twins, Olivia, and um, now the other names see in my head. And Lindsay, thank you. And uh, we got a minute and a half. I'm going to let the other commentators hop on here in a minute. And uh, thank you for watching. And we're back. Thank you, Brandon Chenault, for that little commentary during the um, LHS Senior Cheerleading Senior Night. Like he said, we're going to have the second half of seniors uh, during the halftime of the boys game coming up. Now, I'm excited to see um, the performance for the second half of both Coeur d'Alene and Lewiston. Um, usually, when you're down at half as a team, you have a little bit more drive to keep on pushing harder than when you're up as far as you are with Coeur d'Alene being up by 18 points or so, I think. Uh, the scoreboard is off, but um, 
they usually tend to relax a little bit. Yeah, for sure. They definitely overlook the situation in most cases. Not saying Coeur d'Alene is going to be doing that. But, yeah, like you said, the losing team definitely has more motivation to get back into this kind of a chip on their shoulder. And we are going to see if that can make an impact in this third quarter and the rest of this second half. We have Albright inbounding on the sideline for Lewiston. And as we mentioned, that score clock did get unplugged and the score bug and the normal score clock is not lined up. So we will try to get that fixed as soon as we can. Lacen sees Van Trees now McArcher inside for two. Great start to the second half. Yeah, I mean, no doubt about it. Maybe Coeur d'Alene hasn't woken up yet on defense out of this second half. We will see. Colvin now with the ball. Sees Mitchell on the left side. And a good screen and roll, but Albright gets a hold of it for Lewis and looks ahead to Lathan. Lathan in the corner to DeGroote. Now inside to Albright, back out to DeGroote. DeGroote with the three, and it's no good. Mitchell gets the rebound. Sees Colvin. Colvin with an easy two. And we're going to update on that scoreboard. It is Lewiston 15, Coeur d'Alene 35. We'll keep you updated until that score bug does pop up. DeGroote inside McCarcher. McCarcher for another two. I think that halftime talk really changed her performance in this game so far. Yeah, no doubt about it. The Lewiston offense is looking like a whole different team than what we saw in the first half. Mitchell now with the ball. Up top to Holakek, now Carroll. Holakek now, back to Carroll. Hand off to Mitchell, now Colvin. Long possession, great defense by the Bengals. Holakek up top to Mitchell. Mitchell in her three pointer is just short and Albright with the rebound. But also great, good ball movement by Coeur d'Alene, able to get a good looking shot as Albright drives in, but an offensive rebound by McCarcher. She's gonna go up, fadeaway jumper is no good. A foul on DeGroote. That was a pretty interesting foul there. Ball got knocked out of uh, Colvin's hands and then she sort of stepped on it and tripped over it. Yeah, that was just kind of an awkward play there. And just an update on that score. It is loose in 17, Coeur d'Alene 35. Get that fixed as soon as possible. Carroll hands it off to Colvin, and Colvin goes in, and it's no good to Groot with the rebound. To Groot taking the ball down the court. Sees Van Trees on the right side. Inside McCarcher. McCarcher with another attempt at two, and it's no good. DeGroote with the offensive rebound, throws it up, also no good. This Bengal team is looking a lot more aggressive and wanting a stronger fight for the ball than what we saw in the first half, looking like a much stronger team. Colvin now inbounding and passes it off to her sister, Tegan. Taking her time getting down the court, really no rush when you're up by 18 points. Mitchell now at the ball, drives in, hands it off to Carroll, and Lathan gets a hold of it. Lathan sees Albright inside of McCarcher. McCarcher, and it's no good. Yeah, the Bengals didn't have numbers there on that offensive possession. I would have liked to see Lathan slow the ball down and really get an offensive movement going. That just kind of left McCarcher double teamed in the paint and then not a very good shot there. Colvin now with the ball. Sees Holakek. Holakek with the pass to Carroll. It's no good. Albright gets hold of it. Looks ahead to Lathan. Now Albright. And Albright with the shot. Gonna have a foul. She's gonna be at the line for two. Now when Lathan was driving down the court 
if she would have looked up while she was dribbling, she would have saw Van Treese wide open on that left side, and Van Treese easily could have gone in for that lay-in. Yeah, I saw that exact same thing. Normally we want Lathan to slow the ball down, but in that instance, definitely, yeah, bounce that, bounce pass it to Van Treese. Yeah, that was going to be a wide open lay-in for two. Albright's first free throw is up, and it's no good. And her second one's up, and it's good. Col Colvin now with the ball. Dribble is off, it off to the left side. Sees Colvin up top, then to the right to hold a kick. And now Colvin. Colvin on the left now. Some good defense from Lewiston. Colvin now with the shot. It's no good. She draws a foul, though. Yeah, that was good defense by Lewiston, as you said. Just better offense from Colvin, kind of weaving through defenders and able to attract that foul. She'll go on the line and shoot, too. It's Lewiston's third team foul. It was also a great balance of pressure from Lewiston, not strong enough to the point where they can easily be uh, driven through, but just enough so where Coeur d'Alene is not wide open for those three-pointers that they tend to make every once in a while. Yeah, I saw that in that first half. They're either way too much on the perimeter or way too little in the inside. And the, yeah, like you said, finding that balance is very key for this Bengal defense. Lathan now with the ball. Sees Van Trees on the right. Van Trees and McCarcher. McCarcher with two. That was really impressive there. I did not think McCarcher was going to get that ball with the two Coeur d'Alene girls surrounding her, but she was able to and get two points on the board. But Holikek responds with the three. Yeah, just I was about to say, loose and getting momentum just down 16. That lead extended to 19 for Coeur d'Alene after that three in the far corner. Just demoralizing for this Bengal team. They fight so hard on offense, but just one three just kind of depletes all of that momentum. So that score is 20 from Lewison and 39 from Coeur d'Alene. Still trying to get that score bug working. Lathan now sees McCarcher. And Colvin gets a hold of it. Somehow that worked for yeah. Coeur d'Alene. Just kind of a heave in the middle of the court. Mitchell now at the ball. Hands it off to Colvin. Now Mitchell in the corner. Drives in and two is good for number two, Mitchell. Yeah, and just like that, some of the momentum shift to all the momentum for Coeur d'Alene here in this third quarter. Just three minutes to go in this third as another, not almost a turnover, but a good way to poke it is 54, Carroll. Great interior defense. Lewison has had a lot more luck finding McCarcher uh, inside that key, but you still need to remember they can't force it every single time. Well, another thing is three is greater than two, and Coeur d'Alene has been able to knock down those three-pointers. Lewiston, usually DeGroote has some luck at threes, and Van Trees just had luck for a three. Yeah, as Wesley says, that is all nylon Wesley? there. Wesley? I'm not Wesley. No, but that's what Wesley says. Okay. All nylon there. <laughs> And it looks like maybe Carroll's going to be at the line for two after being fouled by DeGroote. I believe that's DeGroote's third personal. It is. So she'll, be have to, she'll have to be careful. She has a whole another quarter and then two and a half minutes add on to that. And Carroll's first one is up and good. She's one for three right now at the line. See if she can make it 50%. And her second one's up, and it's good. Lathan now at the ball. Looks ahead to Van Trees. Inside McCarcher. Again, like I said earlier, you can't force it McCarcher. It may have worked earlier, but Coeur d'Alene can easily adjust their defense to now uh, smother McCarcher when she's in the paint. And Lucin doing a good job of smothering of their own, but that is no worry for Carroll there, able to split that double team and go in, up in for two. That looked easy. McCarcher now. Now Van Trees. 
Van Trees looks inside McCarcher, and McCarcher throws it up. It's no good. Wallace gets the rebound. And a good move from Walls, but the shot is no good. Van Trees gets it for Lewiston. Van Trees sees Lathan. Now Van Trees up top on the right to McCarcher. McCarcher looks inside. It's picked off by Lopez. McCarcher gets a hold of it though. Now Lathan. Now DeGroote, DeGroote with the three, and it's no good. And Colvin with the rebound. Yeah, kind of like a weird sequence of events there, but no score for Lewiston as number 10, Carisha Wallace travels. Couple substitutions for Coeur d'Alene and one for the Bengals. A minute nine to go here in this third quarter as we get that score bug up. Sorry, I was not looking there. I don't know when that got up, but a great job by that media team to get it working again. Thank you to you guys out there in the trailer. McArthur will now be, the, be at the line for two after being fouled. This is her first time at the line. I think it's really big for the Bengals. If they can cut the lead to 15, that is a very manageable lead to come back to here in this fourth quarter. Get some momentum here before this third quarter ends and start to itch back away at this lead. Her second one's up and it's no good. Lopez gets the rebound. Sees Holokek. And Lopez with the two. A great lob pass from Holokek there. Right over Lewison's defense. Lathan now with the ball. Yeah, after two missed free throws by McCarcher and then a wide open two for Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene is just easily getting all the momentum here and the Bengals look like they're start to fall apart. We have Kessinger coming in for Lewiston and Addison McCarcher is gonna take a seat. And then we have Larson coming in for Coeur d'Alene and I think Carroll's gonna go ahead and take a seat. Lathan now at the ball up top. Sees Kessinger on the right inside to DeGroot. And a pretty physical attempt by DeGroot there but it's no good, Wallace gets a, now has it for Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, there was plenty of time on that shot clock. She was triple teamed in the paint. I'd like to see her kick that ball out and get a better looking shot. Especially because if there's uh, three defenders on one girl, then someone outside uh, is wide open. Yeah, a couple people outside would probably be wide open, but Bengals will get the last shot opportunity. Three seconds to go. DeGruy with the ball. And they're not going to take a shot. Yeah, Bengals maybe not aware of that play clock, or yeah, play clock winding down. And so they're gonna go into this fourth quarter, loose in 23, Coeur d'Alene 47. They have a lot to chip away if they wanna get back into this game. And we will see you at the start of this fourth quarter. And so heading into this fourth quarter, Bengals find themselves down big. Coeur going to start with the ball. And you'd imagine Coeur would like to utilize that shot clock before they get a shot up. Colvin now with the ball. Sees Mitchell on the left side, inside to Carroll. Back outside to Holocock. Holocock with the three. 
bounces on the top of the backboard. Carroll gets the rebound. Alcock again in the corner, and it's no good. Yeah, great job by her for sticking with it. Missed badly the first one, but that second one looked a lot better. And now Colvin with the three, just short. And now Delic gets the rebound. Taking it down the court with some haste. Sees Vantrese on the left side. Back up top to Lathan. And a great steal from Colvin. She has all the time in the world for that two points. Yeah, Colvin just kind of looks like she's just effortlessly just making plays on defense and offense. Looks like it's too easy for her. Van Therese now up top. Sees Delic on the right side. Now Lathan on the left. All the way cross court to Van Tree. Sort of, I'm surprised a quarter lane player didn't pick that pass off. Kessinger now in the corner. And her shot's just long. And Colvin gets the rebound. Looks ahead to Holikek. Now Carroll. Carroll with the two points. Delic now. And a miscommunication past him. McCarcher. McCarcher wasn't even looking at her. And Mitchell gets the two points again. Yeah, this Bengal team just kind of looks defeated. They really just have a defeated look on their face. And they just need to get some offense going as Coach Julie Fisher is going to call a timeout, hopefully to fix what she sees on both offense and defense. And we're going to take that break with them. Six minutes and eight seconds left to go in this game. And we are back after that full Lewiston timeout. The Bengals are going to start on offense and Cordelaine on defense, pressing DeGroote. DeGroote sees Bomber. Now up top to Albright. Now DeGroote with the screen. Albright looks inside McCarcher. McCarcher cannot keep a hold of it. Yeah, that's just part of the smothering interior defense that Coeur has been doing all game long. And it just kind of wears you off as an uh, offensive player inside. You're just kind of tired of that swarming defense. Colvin now with the ball. Looks to Larson. And now Wallace with the ball. And two after a fancy layup there. Yeah, that was very pretty. I don't know if we can get a replay on that. Maybe not. But wow, just kind of floating in the air. And that was very pretty. DeGruy with the ball. Goes to the two and it's no good. Lopez gets the rebound. Looks ahead to Culver. And Culver to Larson. Now to Bridge. Culver again. Then Wallace in the corner for three and it's good. Yeah, this quarter lane team is just a very solid three point shooting team. And that is really what has uh, separated them between the Bengals. McCarcher responds with two points. And no one's there helping Culver, but she does a long pass to Wallace. Wallace to Larson. It's tipped off from a Lewison player. And we have a sub. We have Colvin taking a seat in Holokek out on the floor. All right, Ali. so the weather is getting warmer, and you know what that means. Spring is coming, and you know what that means. Spring tennis. sports, especially tennis. Tennis. Yep. So we are both tennis players. Allie's a lot better than I am, but, <laughs> you know, we got our first not really official practice, but a little some court time yesterday. 
And you know, who knows, maybe maybe we'll get a couple streams for tennis. Maybe some outdoor streaming may come your way, maybe not. Maybe a little teaser there. Wallace with the two points for Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, if anyone at home wants to know, I actually taught Asher tennis That's over right. the summer, his, uh, the summer before his freshman year. Coeur d'Alene now with the ball. Lopez and now Bridger and Bridger with the two points. Albright now with the ball. Goes to the shot. It's no good. She draws a foul though. She's going to be at the line for two. So make sure to stick around because after this game, we got the boys varsity playing Coeur d'Alene. They lost on the road to Coeur d'Alene by 10. They actually ended up playing in a middle school because of, I believe, flooding or I don't, yeah, I think it was flooding in the Coeur d'Alene gym. And so they had to move to a middle school. So they played without a shot clock. So that could be a big factor. And obviously playing at home, a different environment. So the Bengals looking for a home win against Coeur d'Alene for sure as the group goes up for two. Wallace now with the ball. Sees Holokek on the right side, then to Bridge. Holman gets a hold of it from Lewiston. Sees Bomber. Bomber with a bounce pass to McCarcher. It's going to be a foul on 21, Coeur d'Alene, Lopez. DeGroote now inbounding onto the basket. And we're gonna have some subs. Kessinger coming onto the court and DeGroote taking a seat. Yeah, this is a great opportunity to run your plays against a very good team. Just excellent practice for these Bengals. As a tipped pass by Wallace. Good defense there on Albright. And we have McCarcher coming in for her sister. Addison McCarcher is going to take a seat. Albright now inbounding for the second time. And Albright caught that deflection, and that's going to be out of bounds on the Bengals. So just miscues after miscues. I've really been the story of the game for the Bengals. And Coeur d'Alene have find themselves up big with just over a minute left to go. Wallace with the ball. A good bounce pass. Holman fouls Larson while she's going up for the two. Larson at the line for her second time tonight. She's 100% at the line so far. And she's going to keep that 100% so far. See that replay, a hard foul by Holman. Second one's up. And it bounces around and goes out. Bomber now at the ball. Sees McCarcher. Now to Albright. Hands it off to Bomber. Bomber with the three. And it's no good. And that looks like that will be the last play of the game. So your final score is loose in 28, Coeur d'Alene 64. Coeur d'Alene winning big on the road. And up next in about 20-ish minutes will be boys varsity. And that is probably all for me tonight. Ali will hop on for the boys game. And we will see you in about 20 minutes for the boys varsity game.
Hello and welcome to the second game tonight on the stream. Uh, we have boys varsity basketball playing now. We have the Coeur d'Alene Vikings against your very own Lewiston Bengals. Brian Chenault is now joining me and we have Asher Fife out on the hero camp somewhere. Um, Braden has some quick stats and then we'll be here with starting lineups. Yeah, so two weeks ago we played uh, Coeur d'Alene um, up there. Uh, Lewiston lost uh, 40 to 52. So a little bit of time for these boys to get redemption. Lewiston right now is sitting uh, fourth place in the 5A, 4A Inland Empire with three wins, three losses, and an overall of 11 wins to 17 games. Where Coeur d'Alene is 6-0, first place in the Inland Empire, 15 to 18 overall wins out of 18 games. And right now they are ranked number two in the state of Idaho, only gets Hawaii. So they're on that winning streak right now in the, in the conference with five winning streaks. So it'll be interesting to see if this is going to be a six winning streak for Coeur d'Alene or if Lewiston's going to be able to get redemption from last time. And, and now Coeur d'Alene has started their starting lineups. We have number zero, Gunnar Larson, a senior at a height of 6'3". And then we have number one, Logan Orchard, a 6'3 senior. Number two, Carter Rupp, a 5'10 uh, junior. Number 14, Kai Wheeler, a 6'3", junior. And then number 24, Caden Simmons, a 6'4", sophomore. And I'm looking to see if I missed any. I don't think I have. And now we have the Lewis and Bengals, their starters. And the first one is going to be number two, Jordan Bramlett, a 5'9", senior. And now number four, Jordan Walker, a 5'7", sophomore. Number 33, Drew Hottinger, a 6'5", senior. We have number one, Ryland Gomez, a 6'4", senior. And now number 44, Blaze Hepburn, a 6'1", freshman. Really excited for this game tonight. Uh, I'm excited to see if Lucent has a little more luck than our girls team earlier today. The girls lost to Coeur d'Alene by a pretty big point differential. Yeah, I know the boys team talked with some of them today, you know, through the class, through the hallways, during lunch. They're excited for this game. They're excited to get back on the on the court with these same boys and just get that win. They're just, that's all they're hoping for right now is just get that redemption from two weeks ago. Gomez and Orchard for the tip off. Larson gets a hold of it for Coeur d'Alene, sees Orchard. Orchard keeps up top. Good defense from Gomez. Orchard then to Simmons. It's a good patience from Coeur d'Alene all the way across to Rook. Then to Larson, Larson can't keep a hold of it. Gomez gets it for Lewiston, takes the ball down the court, hands it off to Bramlin. now Hottinger. And it's picked off by Simmons. Quick drive down the court. And the first two points of the game goes to Simmons of Coeur d'Alene. Bramlett, Bramlett now with the ball, excuse me. Looks inside to Hottinger. Hottinger then to Walker. Now Bramlett. Bramlett with the quick move and the easy two points for him. Orchard now at the ball, sees Larson. Back to Orchard. Now Rupp. Quick communication with his offense there, calls for a screen, then hands it off to Wheeler. And it's gonna be a foul. Yeah, or a great start of this game. Foul's on number two, Bramlett of Lewiston. We have Orchard inbounding it from under the basket. Orchard sees Simmons. Simmons up top to Larson. Now to Rupp. Rupp with the three and it's good! Bramlett now with the ball. Bramlett with some quick moves. Sees Hunter up top. Now to Hepburn. 
Hepper goes inside. Now Hottinger. Some good patience from Lewison. And Hottinger with the shot. It's no good. Gets his own rebound. Goes up again. And it's no good. Orchard gets the rebound. Looks ahead to Rupp. Now to Simmons. Then the corner to Larson. Larson goes back up top with it to Orchard. Orchard with the long three. And it's no good. Larson gets the offensive rebound. Now Orchard, then Simmons. Now in the corner, Wheeler with the two points. Nice jump shot from Wheeler there. So far, both teams having a lot of patience, a lot of the control, waiting for that open shot to be available. Mm -hmm. I think part of that's also because of both teams' uh, strong defense work. Especially from Coeur d'Alene here. We yeah. see a couple unsuccessful plays from Lewiston the last two plays, I think. And Coeur d'Alene again just responded with another two points, which led to Mom taking a timeout. You know, they're laying that you know, deep threes. That, I think, is their second or third one they've let, you know, slide up. So I think, you know, Mom's going to try to get these guys, boys in and watch out for that three when it comes to defense from Coeur d'Alene. It's really important for your defense that you have enough pressure that you don't leave them op wide open for a three, especially with Coeur d'Alene hitting them so far tonight. But you don't put on too much pressure to the point where Coeur d'Alene can easily drive past you and go up for a layup with the basket because that's an easy two points for them. Exactly. And when you're playing with such skilled members on both teams, you have to be careful about that. You know, having a good balance between you know, being uh, too aggressive and not aggressive enough, you know. That's also what happens uh, with fouls. You want to make sure you don't get into foul trouble too early in the game mm -hmm. because that can lead to the coach making some difficult decisions that can change the overall outlook of the game. Hottinger now with the ball sees Gomez. Gomez goes up and it's no good. Wheeler gets the rebound, sees Larson, and it's picked off. Bramley gets a hold of it. Bramley with the spin move in the two and it's no good. And now Rupp with the ball. A good lob pass and two points for Wheeler. You know, Wheeler's going to be one of those people he might have to get, you know, tag team when it comes to defense. He's a very strong player. We've seen that time and time again, not just here, even as a sophomore. He's just been killing on the court this year, looking at some of the highlight reels. Rupp now with the two points. And Hepburn inbounds it to Bromlett. Mm -hmm. They're looking to slow it down now. Might yeah. Maybe set a pace of their own and not let Coeur d'Alene keep control of this fast-paced game here. Hottinger now at the ball. And good defense from Coeur d'Alene, but Hottinger keeps a hold of it. Now Bramlett. Now Gomez with the three, and it's no good. Hottinger gets the offensive rebound and gets the two after knocking Larson over. Again, some aggressive play style from both teams here. Yeah, I think Lucent's now starting to slow it down. I think they came out a little bit high nerves, you know, a little anxious, you know, trying to go against, go, go against uh, Coeur d'Alene for the second time. And I think now they're starting to slow down. So seeing that, With that fast pace, as you're saying, when Lewiston set that fast pace up, yeah. Coeur d'Alene really thrived during that pace. Mm -hmm. And so they realized they sort of need to slow it down a little bit. Bramlett now at the ball. Bramlett to Fisher. Or, excuse me, yeah, Fisher. Orchard with the ball. Sees Larson. Larson with the shot, and it's no good. Gomez goes for the rebound, keeps it in to Bramlett. Mm -hmm. Bramlett now with the ball. Now Fisher. And some fight for the ball. Again, Lewiston learning how to use their um, aggression correctly. You know, Gomez, I think, had a pretty good, you know, showed that aggression being used in a good way. It's really yeah. important that you're aggressive but not too aggressive. You don't want to rack up fouls too yeah. early in the game. 
Exactly. That is going to be, I think, one of the keys if Lucent has a chance on winning this game is getting that good, get everything dialed in correctly when it comes to the aggression. Bogart now with the ball. Now Fisher. Gomez on the inside. He draws a foul. He's going to be at the line for two. Fouls on number one, Coeur d'Alene, Larson. One thing you also got to do, this is going to probably be a close game. So not letting the other team get these points from foul shots is going to be key. On the other hand, it's really important that you make these free throws because they can change whether or not you're in the lead in this game. Yeah. Gomez's first one is up, and it's no good. His second one's up, and it's good. Orchard now at the ball. Sees Wheeler. Or, excuse me, yeah, Wheeler. Now Orchard again. Wheeler on the inside. Hands it off to Roop, and Roop gets the two points. Mm -hmm. Loosen defense has been good about, about watching out for those corner threes, but those two layups have just been killing them these last couple of plays. Gomez with the strong pass to Walker, but it goes right to his feet and goes out of bounds. And it's going to be Simmons inbounding for Coeur d'Alene. Simmons to Orchard. Some good controlled defense from Gomez here on Orchard. Orchard drives in, passes it back out. And now Simmons in the corner for three, and it's no good. Roop gets the rebound, and his shot's no good. Gomez finally gets a rebound for Lewiston and passes it off to Walker. And Walker's going to be fouled. The foul is going to be number two, Rup of Coeur d'Alene. Looks like there's going to be some subs, too. Walker's going to take a seat, and Bramlett is going to come back out. Yeah, Coeur has been, I have noticed, um, especially with Simmons and um, Orchard, has been having really good communication out there, working together as a team. You know, sitting back and having those team roles being played. And it's been showing off. And Bramlett now with the two points after an amazing pass from Gomez. Again, that's a great connection that we see from Lewiston, just like um, between Orchard and Simmons, like you said, from Coeur d'Alene. Orchard now with the ball. Goes for a move and makes two. Even though the move wasn't super successful with him getting past his defender, he's still able to make it go in the basket. Bramlett can't, Bramlett can't keep a hold of it. And Orchards now has the ball for Coeur d'Alene with a quick bounce pass. Gomez gets a hold of it, and he steps out of bounds. Gets some assists from his teammates to get up. Yeah, hard hit. Playing, yeah, just trying to keep that ball in. Nip now inbounding for Coeur d'Alene, and we have a sub. Looks like Orchard is going to take a seat, and Riley is going to come out onto the floor. Nip now inbounding. See Simmons. And good defense from Fisher. And Bromlett now with the ball. And Bramlett with the two points. Again, great defense from Fisher on that last play. Sort of forced Simmons to uh, force that pass and made Bramlett pick it off. And Bramlett almost picks another one off. Yeah, we're starting to see that. And, you know, looking at the roster, you know, my ex told me height doesn't matter, but everyone on this team's over six foot <laughs> except number two. <laughs> now, height does not equal athleticism. But that is something I would like to point out that Coraline has in their corner is height. Especially now, number 13 on the floor right now from Coeur d'Alene. He's 6'6". Six, six. That's just absolutely crazy. And, you know, he's still got another year to grow in high school. He might go another, you know, two or three inches. You never know. Fisher with the three. It's no good. And now Rupp with the ball. Sees NZ. And now up top to Orchard. He's back in the game after being subbed off really quickly. Now Nip up top to Rupp.
and a quick screen from NC. Orchard now with the ball. Orchard with the two, and it's good. Bramlett now with the ball for Lewiston. Bramlett with the long three, and it's just short. Looks like he's going for a buzzer beater shot. Sending up a little early, though. I think he probably could have taken a couple more steps and take the shot there. Maybe yeah. had a little bit more of a chance of making it. Yeah. And, you know, you're also starting to see these coaches understand this isn't going to be just a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. So you're going to start seeing, you know, number one from Coeur Lane Orchards was subbed in, subbed out. You know, I think these coaches, especially here in the, the second or, yeah, second quarter, are going to start doing a little bit more subbing, give those guys a break. Because, again, it is going to be a marathon, not a sprint this game. They're very competitive teams, close game, um, really good players, talented, skillful. So, again, they're going to start slowing. I think they're going to start slowing that down. You already see that from Lewiston, too. At the very beginning of the first quarter, it was very fast-paced. And then Lewiston decided to slow it down a bit, be a little more realistic with how they're going to play the entirety of this game at more of a medium pace instead of just how high intensity it was earlier. Yeah, and I think that's starting to work out for them. You know, they were definitely starting to get, you know, very behind on points. So, and now it's starting to get, you know, tied up. And with that slower pace, it allows them to have a little more control. Mm -hmm. um, a lot less frantic out on the court, which yeah. is always helpful, especially at this uh, varsity high school level. Mm -hmm. Lane now inbounding. We have Nip inbounding to Rupp. Rupp keeping his dribble alive, drives in, decides to take it back out to Orchard. Orchard goes in and goes for the two points, and it's no good. Hottinger with the rebound. Now to Bramlett. Bramlett communicating with his offense right now. Gets a screen from Hottinger. Bramlett throws it up, and it's no good. NC gets the rebound, passes it to Orchard. Orchard to Rupp. Rupp with the three, and it's no good. Gomez gets the easy rebound for him. Gomez taking the ball down the court. Looks inside and tries passing it out to Bogar. That's the second inaccurate pass from Gomez right here. His first one going to Walker where it hit off his feet and the second one going right out of bounds uh, when he tried passing to Bogar. Yeah, and I think part of that is he's slowing down a lot of this play, but not his passes. I think that is starting to, you know, starting to affect the game and definitely affect his performance during the game. Or it could be the fact that maybe he's still in the mindset of having this high intensity pace, but the rest of his team sort of slowing down and doing a more comfortable pace for them, and he's he's taken a little bit to adjust to that. Yeah. Coeur d'Alene just got another two points on the board, and now Bramlett has the ball. Now Gomez. Gomez keeping his dribble alive, looks inside of Hunter. Hunter. And his shot is no good. Really thought that was going to sink in, decided not to. And now Rupp with the shot, and it's no good. Gomez with the rebound. And he hands it off to Walker. Yeah, good defense again from the Lewiston. Not letting any of those threes get in. You know, they let that happen one too many times at the beginning, and they realize we're not going to let that happen anymore, and they've been keeping to that, I think, that promise. That's a great adjust from them, and it can also be seen as great coaching from mom. They had a quick mm -hmm. timeout, and we see after that timeout that they aren't letting those threes sink in for Coeur d'Alene anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, talking about mom, he's definitely well-known uh, for his uh, loud character, but I think he is, at the end of the day, a pretty good coach. You know, he might yell at his uh, players right at the beginning, but he definitely comes up, follows up with a nice uh, conversation, you know, not angry, not at Grants. You know, he gets down, he talks with them, he communicates with them well. And I think you definitely see that in the program over the last year or two. And Hepper now with the ball up top. Sees Bramlett on the right side. Bramlett drives in, passes it back out to Walker. And Walker now to Gomez up top. And Gomez is going to travel after doing a little bit of a stutter step while he's dribbling the ball. Yeah, you know, we talked about uh, Gomez not slowing down uh, in that mindset of 
with the rest of his team slowing down, but he's not. And I think you were true about that, and we're, we're starting to see that more and more on the plays. Be a little bit more sloppy, be a little bit more rushed. And Coeur gets another two on the board. Despite this pace that Lewis is set and Gomez sort of not really setting up with it, they do have great patience. Um, we see a lot of the times for their plays, they drive in, they realize it's not there, so then they pass it back out, and they just keep on trying, trying, trying mm -hmm. in the 35 second of the shot clock, and they just sort of wait for that open shot where they can make an easy two or three. Mm -hmm. And luckily for them, they haven't run in a time where the shot clock ran to zero, luckily, so they've been good about keeping on that. And now Wheeler... Now back up top to Orchard. Orchard with the shot, and it's no good. Wheeler with the rebound, and his shot's no good. Some great offensive rebounds from Coeur d'Alene here. Really impressive because Hottinger and I think Gomez were right all over those rebounds, but Coeur d'Alene still kept a hold of it. You know, both teams have been playing good defense, but Coeur has been playing slightly better offense, and you can tell by the score of that. Um, you know, I think Lucy needs to has been needs to work a little bit more on their offense uh, in this game, and maybe possibly in practice, because they've just been getting their butts handed to them uh, during this game when it comes to offense. Still pretty early in the game, though. Mm -hmm. Just a couple little fixes can easily change the game in Lewiston's favor here. We have a sub going for Lewiston. Walker is going to take a seat, and Fisher is going to be coming out on the floor. Fisher inbounds it to Gomez all the way across court. Now Fisher again, Hepburn up top, then to the right to Bramlett. Now Gomez in the right corner. And he goes in for the two and it's good. Great patience from Bramlett sort of uh, directing his way through the traffic of Coeur d'Alene's defense and is able to put go up for the shot and get two on the board. Yeah, Bramlett's been really good about slowing down this game. And Wheeler now with another two shots. We have Mom call a full timeout, so we're going to take a quick timeout with them. And we are back after that full timeout. We have Coeur at 25, Lewiston at 13. Excited to see how the game plan has changed after this timeout from Mom. If you were Coach Mom, what would you be talking about in this timeout? That's one of the questions I always get asked. Control your game. Set your pace. Don't let Coeur d'Alene set it. Because if you have control over the pace, um, over the game as a whole, you'll start racking up points on that scoreboard and Bramlett just went up for the three and it's no good. Another important three thing that Lucen has done a pretty good job so far of doing is not forcing the shot or forcing the pass. They're able to drive in, realize that it's not open, pass it back out and that's one thing that we sort of see the girls team have some difficulty with. Fisher just getting a three from Lewiston, mm -hmm. but a lot of the times Lewis, the girls team sort of forces a pass and forces the play to work. But another part about basketball is improvisation and reading your defense and changing your game plan or play based on that. Wheeler now in the corner, or excuse me, NC, and now Simmons up top to Orchard. Orchard, then to Larson. Larson with the three, and it's good. Bramlett now with the ball. And Bramlett sees Gomez. Now back up top to Bramlett. Back to Gomez on the left side. Up top to Hepburn, then the right 
to Fisher. Fisher with the three. A great response from Fisher there, responding to, I think, Simmons' three that Coeur d'Alene just had. Larson, you know, no. My bad. No, you're good. It's my bad for jumping in. But, man, Fisher came out of that timeout and has just been fiery. You know, not aggressive, not, you know, pushing, just coming out fiery, making, I believe, two threes since he came off the, came off the bench for that timeout. So great to see. And Gomez with the three again. They're racking up threes right now. Mm -hmm. Right after that timeout, again, shows you how effective a, of a coach mom can be, sort of hyping up his team, getting them ready to score some big points. Orchard now with the ball, drives in, hands it off to Wheeler. Now back up top to Simmons. Simmons drives in. And a charge is gonna be called. Mm -hmm. The yeah. charge was on Simmons. Yeah, definitely got the loosened bench fired up about that char the charge call. Definitely does help when you're on home turf. You have that student section with you. Mm -hmm. Keeps you a little bit pumped up. However, I don't think any student section will be as big as the one we recently had against Coeur or not Coeur d'Alene, Clarkston, where Lewiston uh, beat Clarkston for the Golden Throne game. Gomez now with the ball. Up top to Fisher, then to Hepburn. Hepburn with a good move, but he's going to have a travel. Those moves can be really effective, but you always have to remember who your refs are mm -hmm. and make sure that you sort of adjust your plan because they can be called for travels. Yeah. And Lewiston, you know, they've been trying, and I think if they, they've been sticking really good with the threes and really good about slowing down and just finding that pocket, finding that opening. And I think that if they just keep that game plan, keep strong defense, you know, this would be a pretty, you know, keep the game pretty tied. And throughout the entire season, Lewiston's defense has been pretty spectacular. I remember watching them during the Avista tournament in the final against Rocky Mountain, and they were able to beat Rocky Mountain. And now Rupp gets the two points for Coeur d'Alene. But as I was saying, Lewiston was able to uh, keep Rocky Mountain in a low-scoring game, and they were able to come out with a win for the final of the Avista tournament, getting first place. Hepburn now with the three. It's just long bounces off the top of the backboard. I think it's gonna be called out. And if you don't know what we're talking about, uh, during uh, Christmas break, uh, end of the physical calendar year, we streamed the tournament, tur uh, the holiday tournament, the Avista holiday tournament, excuse me, here live uh, on the LHS Bengals. You can still find that in our YouTube. Uh, I just also wanna give a quick shout out. Make sure to subscribe like um, that goes so much you guys don't even understand uh, we reached just roughly over a thousand subscribers recently so big thank you to all of you guys at home for watching and helping us out we're up now with the ball and some good ball handling from him sees nc nc goes up but a foul is going to be called i think it's going to be on the ground yep quarter lane's actually going to be called for the foul and Fisher will be inbounding to Bramlett. We have about 30 sec 37 seconds left in the half. Bramlett now with the ball. Looking to run the clock out as much as they can, I think. And now Bogar back to Bramlett. Bramlett breaks the ankles, and Bramlett with the three. Great to see it. Great to see it got 14 seconds left, so it'll be interesting to see what these plays come to. And now Wheeler with the shot, and it's no good. Bramley with the rebound. He's pumped up for these last 30 seconds of the game. And a really long three for him, and it's just short. Coeur d'Alene still sends it up, but it's after the buzzer. And at the end of the first half, we have Lewiston at 25, Coeur d'Alene at 30. During the half, we will have the second half of our senior night for our senior cheerleaders. I'll be announcing the names for that. And yeah, we'll be back with you shortly.
And I am back to announce for the girls senior uh, cheerleader senior night. We have Brooklyn Eldridge on the floor right now. Brooklyn Eldridge, and now we have Kaylin Osborne coming onto the middle of the floor. And the guy in the hat in the back, as you see, that's Braden Chenault, my other announcer. He's there walking with Kaylin. Osborne, and now we have Jocelyn LeFevre coming on to the middle of the floor. Jocelyn LeFevre, and now we have Cade Hill coming onto the floor. Big shout out to Cade. Ashton and I were talking about tennis earlier in the girls game. Cade was my mixed doubles partner last year for tennis. Cade Hill, and now we have Sophia Gill coming onto the floor. Sophia is also a part of our student ASB, definitely a hard worker. That was Sophia Gill. And now we have Alana Ramos coming out onto the floor. Alana Ramos and now we have Sydney Skinner coming out onto the floor
Hamilton. That was Sydney Skinner. And again, your second half of the senior cheerleading team is Alana Ramos, Sophia Gill, Kate Hill, uh, Jocelyn LeFavre, Kaylin Osborne, Brooklyn Eldridge, and last but not least, Sydney Skinner. Congratulations to all the senior cheerleaders on their senior night. Welcome back to the second half of the boys' varsity basketball game. The second, oh, the 
second game of the night. My voice gave out on me right there a little bit. It happens to the best of us. Yep. And uh, if you're just starting to tune in or you tune in halfway through this game, I'm Brian Chenault. I'm doing color. I'm Allie Olson, and I'm doing play-by-play. -play. And uh, we're bringing you uh, this tonight's game. We have Hepburn inbounding for Lewiston. Sees Bramlin. And again, that nice and easy pace from Lewiston here. Now Gomez on the inside. Hepburn on the right inside to Hondur. Hondur to Gomez. Now to Walker, back to Gomez in the corner. And the three's no good. Walker gets the offensive rebound. Now to Bramlett. Back to Walker, up top. Then to Hepburn. Now Bramlett, Bramlett drives inside, goes to the two, and it's no good. Wheeler gets the rebound for Coeur d'Alene, looks ahead to Rook. And oh. a great, a great block from Gomez there. Great recovery, too, on the defensive end for him. You know, Gomez, we saw it during Golden Throne. I remember seeing it uh, when I was commentating uh, during uh, the Avista tournament, just his defense. Rupp with that three from Coeur d'Alene. Bramlett now with the ball. I remember watching one game from Gomez. I think it was against Lakeland when we had the power out to cheer from. LHS and Gomez dunked the ball and he actually broke the like the rim for a second and he had to dunk on the other side to even it out and allow the game to continue to play and Gomez with that three pointer and it's no good. Hondur with the rebound back up top to Hepburn. Now to Bramlett and Bramlett's pass does not get close enough for Gomez to keep a hold of it. It's going to go out of bounds. I don't know what coach told Gomez during halftime, but man, whatever he said worked. Because he is locked in and he is, I can just tell, but the look of his eyes, his body mo his body language, he's locked in. Coeur d'Alene's pretty locked in too with Rip <laughs> getting his second three of the second half. And now Bramlett with the ball. Yeah, we saw the same thing with Lewis and come out of a timeout, get two threes, and uh, Coeur d'Alene basically said, watch this after halftime, and uh, we're all watching. Orchard now with the ball. Goes on the right. Rupp with another three, and it's good. Man. Three threes Dude, in a row for That Rupp. is crazy. You don't usually see that. Definitely not. Especially at this level, threes in itself are hard to be super accurate on and have a high percentage on. And so for Rook to get three in a row is immensely impressive. Yeah, three in a row like that. You know, Mom got to lock all his troops in again. You know, and be like, hey, don't let that get distract you. Don't let that get into your brain. Lock in. I think Mom was prepared for that three to go in too because that timeout was instant as soon as that ball sank into the basket. I'm guessing he's probably telling his players right now to watch Rub because he's on fire right now. Again, with Coeur d'Alene, you got to watch the pocket threes. They're deadly with those pocket threes. I don't know what their workout routine is, but they have made almost every three before Mom has to call a timeout and rein in his defense on watching out for them. However, in the first half, we did see them start, uh, Coeur d'Alene did start sinking through right at the beginning of the game. And then after a quick timeout, Lewis quickly adjusted their defense and was able to shut down those three-pointers for most of the rest of the first half. So I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see something similar right now from Lewiston. Bramlett now with the ball. And Bramlett sees Fisher up top. Back to Bramlett on the right, inside to Gomez. Gomez with the shot, and it's no good. He goes up for a second one, and he gets fouled. Foul was on 14, Coeur d'Alene, Wheeler. Gomez will be at the line for the second time tonight. He's 50% at the line right now, going one for two. His first one's up, and it's no good. And the second one's up. 
And it's just long. He's now going one for four at the line. Simmons with the rebound and the quick restart for Coeur d'Alene. Pass it to Orchard. Orchard does a quick pass to what looks like Rub, but goes out of bounds. It's going to be Fisher's ball. Coeur d'Alene now slowing their momentum down a little bit. Yeah, I think Coeur d'Alene certainly has had the same problem Lucent had at the beginning of the game. They were playing too fast. They were getting a little angsty, a little nervous. Throwing the ball maybe a little too quick, not being a little bit too clear. And Bramlett's three is good. Yeah, Bramlett's going to start responding with those threes. Be like, hey, we can throw threes too. Exactly, and Bramlett stole the ball and is going for another two points, and it's good. That's another thing about the timing of Mom's past timeout. When Coeur d'Alene had all the momentum, that timeout allows them to settle and sort of lose that momentum a little bit. You know, I think they lost a little bit of momentum, and they still had that anxiousness, that jumpiness. Wheeler with two on the board. It's going to be a 30-second timeout, so we'll stay here with them. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene called that timeout. And I think Coeur coaches are, you know, starting to realize what we're starting to say. They're slowing down that momentum, but still having the nerves, the anxiousness of having a faster pass game. And that is starting not to play in their favor. So he's probably calling that little timeout. Get the, again, as I always like to say, get the troops locked in and uh, get ready for war. And it's really important right now because, yes, Coeur d'Alene is up by 11, but Lewison can easily catch him with a couple of uh, streaks um, on that scoreboard for them. So far, Lewison has been great at just sort of keeping up with the scoring and staying close enough to the point where it can be anyone's game. The key is for Lewis is to push past that point, you know, end of third quarter, the fourth quarter. If they don't, you know, a close game's a close game, but pushing a little bit more makes you win the game. So, I think it's going to be very important for them. Because at the very end of the game, everyone's tank, and the team that could pull through is the team that pushes as hard as they can, even when they're already tanked, and they're already exhausted from the first like three quarters of the game. Coeur d'Alene now inbounding. We have Simmons inbounding. Looks like Bogar's going to come out for Lewiston and Gomez is going to take a seat. Sim Simmons now with the ball. You know, Parker is uh, one of those players you uh, usually doesn't get any first half play action, but uh, when he comes out for the second man, it is always fun to watch. He is always either making a three or making some critical play of the game. So it's always fun to watch him. That's why we get excited. We know him personally. So when he comes in, you know, things are starting to get real. Things are starting to get serious. Foul's going to be called. It's going to be on the ground. Foul was on 44 Hepburn. And Gomez is coming back in after a quick breather on the bench. And Walker's coming in. We have Hepburn taking a seat and Bramlett taking a seat. Again, keeping some of your top scorers of the game um, energized and just getting them quick breathers throughout the game so they can last throughout the entirety of it. Is that Roop again? I believe so. Roop was his, with his fourth third of the second half. Pottinger now with the ball. Now Gomez up top. Gomez hands it off to Walker. Walker dancing with a little bit, sees Fisher up top. Again, good defense from Coeur Lane inside to Gomez. Gomez with the easy two points for him after doing a quick move around Orchard. You know, I was starting to wonder with that shot clock what they were about ready to do. You know, it was running down, they had, I think, I believe eight seconds. Uh, I left on that shot clock again. That shot clock has made a difference uh, since it's been allowed at the high school varsity level. And now Larson with the two points for Coeur d'Alene. I do think the shot clock is really effective because 35 seconds is still a lot of time to set up an offense, maybe run another offense if the first offense doesn't set up. However, for a team like Lewiston where they're used to the shot, the shot clock, it can be quite a shock 
to another team who isn't used to it and they may feel like rushing or something and that can lead to some unforced errors for the other team. Yeah, and also it helps set up these boys for when they go into, you know, post high school, you know, college, uh, whether whatever that may look like for them, JUCO, D1, you know, all the way in between. You know, it helps those boys out where they are going to run into shot clocks. Uh, it just helps them out slightly more um, to be stronger players uh, post uh, 12th grade. Gomez hands it off to Bramlett. Bramlett sees Fisher. Fisher with the three, and it's good. Orchard now with the ball. Sees Wheeler. Wheeler then to Simmons. Up top to Orchard. Now to Rupp. On the left to Orchard. Up top to Wheeler. On the right to Simmons. And Bramley gets a hold of it from Lewiston. Looks ahead to Fisher, and Fisher with the shot no good. Wheeler gets the rebound, looks ahead to Simmons. Simmer, Simmons sees Larson, Larson with the three. It's just short, Wheeler gets the offensive rebound. And a foul's gonna be called. Again, we're, my bad. Um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of um, that watching the three corners that we did in the first. You know, they made a handful of threes in the corner. Mom called a timeout and they started watching and started playing good defense on, three, on that corner three. We saw that in the first half and we're now starting to see that again in the second half. Some good defense from Lewis and Coeur d'Alene keeps a hold of it and it's gonna be rough with another three point attempt and it's gonna be no good. Wheeler with the rebound and the two points for him. He's pretty hyped up about that one there. You know, Fisher and Wheeler have just been killing it this game. Might have to make number 14 my lucky number because they've both just been killing it this game. Gomez now with the ball, goes up for two and it's no good. Orchard gets a hold of it. And Orchard with the shot and it's blocked by Gomez. Gomez now with the ball again. Now, Bogar. And good defense from Rupp. Rupp keeps, gets a hold of it from Bogar and a block from Bogar, but he fouls Rupp. Again, as I said, Parker coming in, always comes in the second half and makes those plays. Good to see. Um, good to see when he comes in, good to see his plays. It's always fun to watch. It's also really important to have a player like that on your team. Maybe they're not a starter, but they're still a really strong player that sits uh, on the bench that you are allowed to sub on for maybe some of your top players and still feel confident in your play going forward. Rupp now at the line. His first one's up, and it's no good. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of play, you know, from Drew Hottinger and uh, Ryan Gomez. Riley, is, yeah, excuse me, Ryan Gomez. So we might have to start seeing those players um, come in and out just because they've been playing for so long. They're starting to look tired, exhausted. And, you know, you want to keep those star players in but not have them uh, burnt out. And Rub's second one is up, and it's good. Hepburn now with the ball. Looks to the left to Bramlett. Bramlett to Gomez, inside to Hottinger. Hottinger keeps a hold of it. Now Gomez, Gomez with the easy two. Quickly getting behind Coeur d'Alene's defense since they were too focused on Hottinger over there. And now Simmons with the ball. Simmons to Rupp on the left side. Gomez gets a hold of it for Lewiston. Now Hepburn up top for an open three, and it's good. And Nip now with the ball, then sees Simmons. Simmons keeping his dribble alive up top. Yeah. 
and Wheeler's gonna sink it in for the last two points of the third period. We have Lewiston at 40 and Coeur d'Alene at 51. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out. We didn't get to do this earlier, but we're gonna make good on our promises. And we have a, a commercial from Sports Physical Therapy. Who is Sport Physical Therapy? We are a locally owned and operated clinic. We support our valley through volunteer work and sponsorship of events and charities. We have multiple orthopedic board certified and the only sport board certified and vestibular certified therapists in the valley. Our therapist mission is to support, protect, and enhance those here in the Lewis Clark Valley. We work to create, promote, and sustain the highest quality physical therapy services in the valley. Sport physical therapy for work, for sport, for life. And we're back after that commercial from Sport Physical Therapy. Thank you to all of our sponsors, especially Sport. And you haven't got to see it yet. We also like to give a big shout out to the Diamond Shop. They sponsor all the replays and and timeouts. Uh, so I'd like to give a huge shout out for them for helping support us. Um, again, we got all this with a grant, but grant money runs out eventually. So having these sponsorships lets us keep, you know, uh, gear that breaks, you know, new cables, stuff like that that goes out, those consumer costs that come with this production. Again, if you haven't, please subscribe, please like. That help, means the world to us. It helps with the algorithm. Uh, gets this out to more people. And we have rope at the line. And his first one's up and it's good. He's now two for three at the line. Let's see if he can make it three for four. And his second one's up, and it's good. 75% at the free throw line for him. You know, one thing I'm learning, uh, I need to make four, 14, 24, and one my lucky numbers. Um, something about players, the last number four on their uh, – Jerseys today have just been killing it. Sim is now at the ball, looks up top to Wheeler. Now on the left to Orchard. And Bramlett gets a hold of it for Lewiston. Bramlett keeping his dribble alive. Sees Gomez. Now Bramlett, Bramlett with a long three, and it's good! Bramlett's been one of those players that has just, you know, got into a good rhythm, you know, realized, okay, we're moving a little too fast, got into a good rhythm quickly, and he's just been carrying it all the way through. He's just been a solid player during this game, and just in general, he's a pretty solid player. So it's just great to see. Simmons now with the ball. Looks for the two, and he's aggressively fouled by Hepburn. Simmons is going to be at the line for the first time this game. And you know, Lewiston really can't be getting these free throws right now. They're down by 10. There's seven minutes left in the fourth quarter. You know, it's tooth and nail, and just letting them have these uh, free throw shots is just not going to help them whatsoever. Simmons first one's up, and it's no good. As you were saying, another thing they don't want to do is get three more fouls and like Coeur d'Alene going to bonus free throws, that would give Coeur d'Alene even more chances at pretty much some free points to go on the board. And Simmons' second one is up and it's good. Bramlett now with the ball. Quick screen from Hepburn, now Hepburn with the ball. Sees Gomez in the right corner. Gomez all the way across to Bramlett. Great, Chris. Pass there, Bramlett goes up for two and it's no good, Orchard with the rebound. Orchard gets past Bramlett's defense, sees Simmons now inside to Wheeler. Now Orchard up top to Simmons on the left side to Nip. Wheeler now. And now Sims with a shot, no good, Gomez with the rebound. Ahead to Bramlett. 
Gomez now. Now Fisher with the three, and it's good. Fisher's percentage at the three-point line tonight has been incredible, hitting most of them that he has. And a travel from Orchard. Definitely feeling the pressure from Fisher's three, I think. You know, I was talking about um, my one just went blank. Uh, Bramlett earlier about being one of those players who's just been slowing down, keeping good pace, and keeping a strong game. And I would say the same thing uh, goes for or, uh, multiple players in Coeur d'Alene, especially Orchard. And NZ with the two points. Looks like he tried to reach for a dunk. Couldn't get high enough, but it's good. And this, and this timeout will be brought to you from the Diamond Shop. And Shop. And Shop. We're back. We have Coeur d'Alene at 56, Lewiston at 46, just a mere 10 points behind them with five minutes and 44 seconds left in the game. Lewiston could easily catch up and even take the lead here. Bramlett now with the ball. Sees Fisher up top. Let's see if he can keep his momentum. And now Gomez. Hepburn now. Hands it off. Now inside to Gomez. Gomez goes up for the two and it's good. And he's gonna be the line. One thing I always say every game, you know, every commentator has things they always say during every game. And I haven't said it yet. It's still anyone's game, really. If they keep up the energy, keep up the pace, this could technically still be anyone's game. Gomez's one and only shot is up, and it's good. And now Orchard with the ball. Orchard looks to the right to Simmons. Now Orchard. Up top to Simmons. Orchard on the right side. They're just going back and forth at this point. And now Rub all the way on the left side of the court. Now Orchard. Six seconds left on the shot clock. And a charge is called after Orchard drives through Gomez. Gomez is pretty happy about that call. Yeah, and we uh, there's some trends with Gomez. Slap always coming out of the second half. Um, and a charge call uh, about halfway through the fourth. We saw a golden throne, and we're seeing it right now. Gomez now with the ball. Sees Hepburn on the left side. Hepburn dribbles back up top, hands it off to Bramlett. Bramlett with the bounce pass to Hottinger. It's gonna come off of Hottinger and be Coeur d'Alene's ball. And now Orchard with it. A long pass all the way to Wheeler. And he's fouled as he goes up for the two. Drew definitely had to shake that one off. I could tell, you know, him coming out of that was a little mad that he let that happen. Uh, but he's starting to shake it off. He played good defense, and uh, this is where we're at. Yeah, Drew is only at two fouls right now, so he's in a pretty comfortable position. However, you still don't want to make pretty careless fouls like that. Um, Wheeler's first free throw was up, and it was good. Now second one's up, and it's good again. 100% the line tonight. Gomez now at the ball, looks ahead to Fisher. Now Bramlett. Bramlett scanning the defense, see what's gonna be the best option he takes through screen. Bramlett now to Hepburn. 
Now Bramlett, Bramlett with the three. It's no good. Orchard gets the rebound, looks ahead to Rupp. Rupp with the three, and it's no good. Simmons gets the offensive rebound, goes back up with it, and he's going to be fouled. Foul was again on Drew Hunter. Back to back fouls for him. Simmons now at the line for the second time, 50%. First one's up and it's good. Second one's now up and it's also good. He's now 75% at the line. Fisher now with the ball. Fisher to Honcher, back to Fisher. Now Bramlin on the right side. Crosses over, drives in, goes for the two, and it's good. And he gets fouled, so and one. You know, Lucen's got to make a strong play here, you know, uh, to break even and start winning here. And you only have, you know, three minutes, 40 seconds left to do that. And uh, these shots are going to help them. Though. Bramlin's one and only shot is up. And it's no good. Bounces around the rim, decides to go out. Gomez with the offensive rebound. Sees Bramlett all the way on the right side. Bramlett goes up again for two, and it's no good. Wheeler gets the rebound this time. Orchard now with the ball. Now Larson up top. Orchard again. Inside to Wheeler. Orchard up top. Orchard goes in, passes it back out to Larson, and it's picked up by Hepburn. Hepburn taking the ball down the court. Looks up top to Bramlett. Bramlett with the three, and it's good. Bramlett finding that pace again, going for those threes. He's learned the layups are not really working this fourth quarter, so he's gonna might you know we might start seeing a turn of him sticking to more three uh, uh, three point throws. Orchards now with the shot, he gets fouled. Foul's gonna be on Hepburn. Orchard will be at the line for the first time tonight. First one's up and it's good. Second one's up and it's also good. 100% the line tonight. And we have a timeout called. This timeout will be brought to you by the Diamond Shop. And We are back after that timeout. We have Lewiston trailing by a mere eight points now. Definitely a close game. It's been a close game throughout the entirety of the game. Bramlett now with the ball. 
Bramley quickly getting down the court. Sees Hunter up top, then to Fisher on the left side. Now to Hepburn. Hepburn inside of Hunter. Hunter goes up, keeps the ball in, throws it right to Orchard. Orchard now to Larson. Now Simmons all the way across to Orchard. Now Larson on that left side, up top to Rupp. Orchard on the right side now. Good defense from Lewiston, sort of keeping Coeur d'Alene under control. Orchard with the ball, eight seconds left on the shot clock. And now Wheeler. And then in the corner, Larson with the three. Bramlett now with the ball. Bramlett to Hottinger. Hottinger inside to Bramlett. Bramlett with the easy two. A great play there. And another timeout called. Presented by the Diamond Shop. Again, big, huge shout out for them for sponsoring us. Uh, all the money helps us out. We're back. Just giving a quick reminder, uh, on Monday, uh, the 5th, boys will be playing here at home versus Lakeland. You can stream that again here on the LHS Bengals. Make sure you subscribe. Tell your family, tell your friends, your relatives that are out of town. Um, support goes a long ways. And a game on Wednesday against Lake City. Um, I thought I was seeing double for a second. Because uh, I just only read late. Again, that game will also be tip off at seven. Both here again at the LHS Bengals. Larson now with the ball. Looks like there's going to be a foul. Foul on number one Gomez. And now Cordelline is in the bonus, so Larson's going to be at the line for I think the first time tonight. My stat lines are a little wonky, but his first one's up and it's no good. And the second one's up. And it's good. And some subs are gonna happen. We have Walker coming on and Hepburn's gonna go ahead and take a seat for Lewiston. Bramlett now with the ball. Bramley easily making it across the timeline. Walker now with the ball up top. Inside to Hottinger. Hottinger goes for two and it's no good. After a quick spin move, Wheeler gets the rebound. And now Orchard, good double team defense from Lewiston. I'm not sure what it's called, maybe a jump ball or something. Yeah, I could not see. Um, but Lewiston definitely coming out of that timeout and playing aggressive. I don't think I've seen that aggressive uh, Nis come out of Lucin yet um, this whole entire game. This timeout is presented by the Diamond Shop. Bengals at 56. A lot of the times, Lewiston has been trailing by 10 this game, not yet to get any closer to Coeur d'Alene's lead. And Bramlin is now going to do an intentional foul on Simmons, definitely just trying to stop that clock there. 
yeah, they're going to have to build as much time as they can to have a chance at getting, you know, 11 points to put them in the, put them in the lead. And that's saying that Rupp won't make this free throw right here, and his first one's up, and it's good. So put that at 12 now. Um, but they have to get just to be in the lead in 51 seconds. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it's going to be pretty hard for them to do. But I still have faith in our uh, the Bengals here. Again, home team, so you got to give them a little bit of faith uh, that they can just make this play. And Rub's second one is up, and it's good. Going five for six at the line. Bramlett now with the ball. Lewis needs some big points on the board right here. Bramlett now for two, and it's good. Foul's called again. None of the players are in crazy foul trouble right now other than Gomez with four. Go with 37 seconds left, it doesn't really matter. And we're starting to see Gomez take a little bit of a, a step back knowing he has four, uh, but not being too aggressive with it. Orchard now at the line. For the second time, he's 100% right now, and he's going to keep that 100% through his third shot at the line. See if he can keep it for his fourth. Yeah, that's definitely someone you don't want free throwing. And it's no good, so he's gonna go 75% of the line. Bramlett now with the ball. Looking to respond. Uh, the best response right now would be a three-pointer for Lewiston. Bramlett now goes for the two, and it's no good. Hottinger knocks it out. Portland gets a hold of it, and again, a foul from Lewis. Again, Lewis is starting to play very aggressive, trying to get these points, you know, 21 seconds on the clock, so they're just trying to, you know, be aggressive with the ball, but uh, it's not really working out for them. They're getting a lot of free throws, which are putting them even farther back on the plays that they are making. So I'll be interested to see if they keep that pace for 21 seconds or if they slow down again like they did at the beginning of the game. And Larson's first one is up and it's good. And at this point, Lewiston doesn't need two points, two point shots. They need the really deep three pointers. And they're definitely not going to be getting the win this game. But, you know, Fisher's been on fire with the threes. Bramlett now goes up for the three and it's no good. Portaline gets the ball. Looks like a travel is called. That's definitely not what you want to do with seven seconds left on the clock. No, I think they're just going to run it. <laughs> yep. They definitely <laughs> planned on running it, but you <laughs> ruined that. Gomez now with the three, and it's good. Good way to end the game for Lewiston, despite um, them losing 61-70. to 70. Pretty um, similar outcome to the last time they met on the 16th, but, again, great effort from Lewiston to keep – um, Portaling close to them the entire game. And again, great effort from Portaling getting another win in the season. So, uh, updating the stat sheet somewhat, uh, Lewison now is 3 4, keeping them still fourth in the Inland Empire. Um, and that puts um, uh, CDA, or, uh, Coeur d'Alene uh, 7 0 in the Inland Empire, keeping them with a six win uh, streak going um, so that puts them roughly close to the spot to get first again Hawaii was at 14 and 3 and now they're at 16 and 3 for uh, Coeur d'Alene so it'll be interesting to see how that switches good luck to Coeur d'Alene good job by uh, the Bengals just trying to keep those points coming so uh, good good game to see good game to watch it was definitely re really entertaining, especially with those three-pointers that Fisher would throw up there throughout the entire second half. And the big block from Gomez is always a Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's about it. Got any, any final outros? Um, I think we're good. Um, this was Ali Olson. This is Brian Chenault. Uh, yeah. Remember, subscribe, like, uh, share with your family members. That goes a long way. Again, big shout out to uh, Sports Physical Therapy and the Diamond Shop and Shop and Shop for the sponsors. This is, uh, again, 
Brandon Chanel, Ali Olson on the LHS Bengals YouTube channel. And uh, we're signing we're off. We're signing off.